This week on the Green Left News podcast, standing with the women of Gaza on International Women's Day, shutting down weapons manufacturers, and how the media uses propaganda and bias in its coverage of Israel's war crimes. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist and I'm here to bring you the news from this week, starting with the huge movement for Palestine in Australia with tens of thousands joining weekly rallies against Israel's genocide in Gaza on March 9th and 10th. Australia is now the only country other than the United States not to restore funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, after Canada, the European Commission and Sweden decided to restore their aid. Australia was one of 16 countries to cut funding to the agency, which is one of the primary organisations delivering aid to Gaza, after Israel accused 12 UNRWA workers of involvement in the October 7 incursion. Now, Israel's yet to provide any evidence of UNRWA workers' involvement in the attack, and the rally in Gadigal or Sydney on March 10 reflected the anger at the Labor government refusing to restore UNRWA funding while continuing military exports to Israel. Palestinian activist Jana Fayed pointed out the silence of Western feminists on International Women's Day. Save your corporate high teas, your bullshit speeches, your ridiculous, laughable social media posts. On this International Women's Day, we don't think of Margaret Thatcher. We don't think of Ursula von der Leyen. We don't think of Hillary Clinton. We think of Bissan. We think of the woman that we honor, the woman in Gaza. And beyond the woman in Gaza, we think of Leila Khalid. said Western feminist silence on Israel's slaughter of 9,000 women and 15,000 children was deafening. There was no Palestinian speaker at the official International Women's Day march in Gadigal the day before, and despite this, some Palestine solidarity activists were determined to speak up, and they chanted Free Palestine and other slogans and held banners demanding an end to the genocide. Paz Amanda Sia from Families for Palestine spoke to Green Left. There's 50,000 women in Gaza right now who are pregnant without any maternity care. There are women who are having babies by C-section without any anesthesia, no pain relief, no aftercare, no homes to go to. There are 15,000 children dead. There are girls using tent scraps for for sanitation, hygienic reasons. They don't have access to toilets. There's no privacy. If I'm not here today for the Palestinian women, then it's just, it's, it's a shame. We have to be. This is a feminist issue. There are women in Palestine who have absolutely nothing and the world has forgotten them. Paz Amandis is one of many who have been maintaining a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week picket outside Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's electorate office in Marrickville, which has now continued for over a month. And Paz told the Green Left that, shamefully, the Prime Minister is ignoring the protesters. She said, We have to keep connecting with fellow activists, organising protests, even just putting up posters and stickers to raise awareness for the cause. She said, we have a responsibility to keep the momentum going. And you can join the picket by contacting Families for Palestine on Instagram or clicking the link in the podcast description. The International Women's Day March in Nam or Melbourne featured a vibrant contingent for Palestine, stressing the links between Palestinian and women's liberation. Nora Mansour from the Australia Palestine Advocacy Network told the rally that Palestine is a feminist issue. 
In Mianjin, or Brisbane, more than 100 Palestinian flags were carried over the Victoria Bridge on March 9, with protesters unfurling a giant 15-metre-long flag and waving flags over the side of the bridge for almost an hour. Protest organiser Phil Monsour said they are protesting the Brisbane City Council and Mayor Adrian Schrinner's complicity in genocide. Down in Nam, thousands braved intense heat to march on uh, March 10, with the city experiencing major heat waves over the weekend. And in Borlu, Perth, more than 100 people protested outside the convention centre where former Israeli Major General Doran Almog, a war criminal, was speaking. Now, Almog's war crimes include the demolition of 59 homes in Gaza, an act of collective punishment, and the murder of Palestinian civilians while he was a senior commander in the Israeli Defence Forces. Rawan Araf, who's the executive director at the Australian Centre for International Justice, said the war crimes allegations against Almog are serious and credible. Almog narrowly escaped arrest in London for his breaches of the Geneva Convention, but the Australian government have given him a visa and allowed him to conduct a speaking tour. Socialist Alliance member Sam Wainwright told the rally that the government should be ashamed of letting Almog into the country. He pointed to Labour's hypocrisy over its refusal to allow Palestinian resistance fighter Leila Khaled into the country to address the Eco-Socialism 2024 conference. A few days later, on March 10, more than 500 people attended the weekend rally in Borlu, banging pots and pans and demanding an end to Western support for Israel. Speakers said Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu's threatened ground invasion of Rafah could kill tens of thousands more people. Hundreds rallied for a permanent ceasefire at the South Australian State Parliament in Corner Yurta or Adelaide on March 10. And there were also protests held outside the Woe Adelaide Music Festival from March 8th to 11th due to the inclusion of Ziggy Marley, who's the son of Bob Marley, and is also a Zionist who has held concerts to raise money for the IDF. The festival also cancelled the performance of Palestinian music collective 47 Soul, claiming that their performance may cause safety concerns. Krista Christianity, who's the chairperson of the Australia Friends of Palestine Association, told Green Left that in the context of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, it is totally inappropriate and wrong for WOMAD to welcome Ziggy Marley to Adelaide. And protests were held across the country in solidarity with journalist Antoinette Latouf, who was unfairly sacked by the ABC in December, because of her support for Palestine. Latouf posted on X that the first day in court revealed that ABC managing director David Anderson was involved in her sacking and that the ABC had been pressured by lobbyists. Protests called for an end to the pro-genocide propaganda on the ABC and other mainstream media platforms. About 120 activists and residents successfully established a community picket on March 8 that stopped work at the Heat Treatment Australia factory in Campbellfield in Nam for the entire day. Now, Heat Treatment Australia, or HTA, provides crucial heat treatment for components of the F-35 fighter jets used by the IDF in their ongoing genocide in Gaza. And Natalie Farah, who was part of the early morning picket, told Greenleft Radio on 3CR that by 5.30 a.m. they had been informed that no workers would be working at the workplace today. She said protesters intend to continue shutting down the facility until HTA burns its contracts with Israel. The picket followed five weeks of consecutive protests outside the factory by Hume for Palestine. And in Mianjin, Brisbane, protesters blocked the road next to the Queensland Parliament on March 7 as part of the campaign to shut down FERA. Ferra Engineering is a manufacturing business that produces critical parts also for the F-35 fighter jets and the Queensland state government gives practical support to Ferra Engineering. 
Greens leader Adam Bant joined the protest and spoke out against providing military support to Israel. Now, the University of Sydney is another organisation that has partnerships with the global arms industry and the Israeli military. And the university's most recently announced partnership in, uh, from last November is with the global weapons and military hardware manufacturer Safran, which collaborates with the Israeli weapons company Raphael. Now, chemistry and physics research at the university is in part funded by Lockheed Martin and the US military. And the university has strong connections with Talus, which produce drones in collaboration with Israeli weapons manufacturer Elbit Systems. In Australia, Talus is involved in the development and production of munitions, missiles, rocket motors, propellant and military explosives. University staff and students are calling on management to immediately close University staff and students are calling on management to immediately disclose all the university's partnerships with the defense industry and militaries and cut ties with military and weapons manufacturers. On International Women's Day, March 8, Albanese took the opportunity to tout his government's supposed commitment to gender equality. He said Labour was delivering, pointing to the expansion of paid parental and family and domestic violence leave, and the idea of adding super to government parental leave. Now these changes will of course benefit some women, but leave the majority to continue struggling with the rising cost of living and structural disadvantages such as the gender pay gap, rising poverty and homelessness. Older women are the fastest growing cohort of homeless people and the number of homeless women aged 35 to 40 and 12 to 18 are also growing rapidly. Access to housing, which is a key driver of domestic violence, is a human right, but the federal government and most state labour governments are refusing to take the crisis seriously and attempting to, to demolish what little public housing is left. The Anti-Poverty Centre said that one solution that would have a big impact on women experiencing poverty and domestic violence would be to increase the rate of welfare payments, such as JobSeeker, to be above the poverty line. This would allow women more financial aut autonomy to escape violent homes and would be easier to access than the restricted escaping violence payment. Meanwhile, the Albanese government is letting the payments fall lower and lower in real terms and refusing to seriously address the housing crisis. And no amount of International Women's Day self-congratulatory X threads and fancy morning teas will convince those facing real financial security that Labour has their back. In Geelong, Socialist Alliance councillor Sarah Hathaway told a Geelong Women's Unionists Network International Women's Day event on March 8 that the cost of living crisis means councils need to play a bigger role to help communities. Hathaway said that the most important thing that councils can do is invest in community services like, such as aged care, maternal child health, leisure, recreation, youth services, libraries, parks and playgrounds. Hathaway said she was concerned about the rising number of women who are being forced to access welfare, food and other necessities. Uh, and driven by domestic violence, mental health, and the escalating cost of living crisis, the number of women who are needing to access these services has risen by 50% this financial year. Women over the age of 40, she said, are the cohort that most needs food relief. And she said that 56,000 women and girls across Victoria approached homelessness services for support over 2022 and 2023. She said family violence was the main reason for this, but evictions and the lack of affordable housing are other key reasons. She also acknowledged the genocide in Gaza, saying it's important that we recognise the impact of war and conflict on women and children, particularly those in Gaza. We know that war, conflict and in the case of Palestine, genocide disproportionately impact women and children. And the Gomorrah traditional owners won an appeal in the federal court on March 6th which sets back Santos's push for its extensive coal seam gas project in the Pilliga Forest and farmland near Narrabri in northern New South Wales. The court found that the Native Title Tribunal's decision in 2022 had not taken into account the expert evidence of climate scientist 
late the late Professor Will Steffen. The court's decision overturned the tribunal's finding, which approved Santos's plan to mine coal seam gas. Chief Justice Deborah Mortimer ruled that climate change impacts must be considered before determining whether a fossil fuel project could go ahead on native tidal land. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. Last episode, we reported on the Flower Massacre, where more than 100 Palestinians were killed and more than 700 wounded when Israeli forces opened fire on a crowd of starving people trying to access food on February 29th. But the Western media went out of its way to obscure and protect the perpetrators of this crime. CNN reported that there was carnage at Gaza food aid site amid Israeli gunfire. And the Washington Post declared that chaotic aid delivery turns deadly as Israeli Gazan officials trade blame. The New York Times headline read, As hungry Gazans crowd a convoy, a crush of bodies, Israeli gunshots and a deadly toll. Other outlets left Israel and Palestine out of headlines altogether. This use of passive voice and language designed to obscure and give the perpetrator benefit of the doubt is a popular trick used by news outlets when reporting on Israeli atrocities. It's clear when compared to reporting on the October 7 attack, which the New York Times headlines included, we are at war, Netanyahu says after Hamas attacks Israel, or how the Hamas attack on Israel unfolded, and Hamas leaves trail of terror in Israel. In those articles, there's a clear identification of perpetrator and victim, and the use of active voice. The mainstream corporate media has failed to tell the truth about what is happening in Gaza. Now this is being highlighted in the Antoinette Latouf case here in Australia, as we discussed earlier in the episode, but is also under fire in Aotearoa on New Zealand, where a rally in Auckland condemned pro-Israeli bias and propaganda on March 2nd. About 500 people joined the rally de demanding an end to the genocide and Neil Scott, who's the secretary of the Palestine Solidarity Network, told the rally that the New Zealand media scalps information to create public perceptions rather than informing the public of the facts so that we can come to the conclusion that what Israel is doing in Gaza is genocide. He said, what Israel is doing in Palestine is apartheid. What Israel is doing in Palestine is occupation. Each of those three, plus way more, are crimes against humanity. And what is the New Zealand media doing and saying about this? Nothing. Protesters then marched to the headquarters of Television New Zealand, where management refused to speak to protesters. Palestine solidarity activists in Canada scored a major victory on March 2nd, shutting down a high-profile meeting between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Italian far-right Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney. Uh, more than 400 people blockaded the event in, in opposition to the two leaders' ongoing support for Israel's war in Gaza, and as well as opposition to Maloney's fascist government. This was a high point in a week of actions where Palestine solidarity activists blockaded major arms manufacturing companies across the country and reinforced growing calls for an immediate embargo on Canadian arms sales to Israel. In Toronto, more than 200 workers, union members and community activists disrupted the morning shift at TTM Technologies, setting up picket lines at three entrances to the facility on February 26. And TTM exports circuit boards for Elbit Systems and Artem Technologies, who are two Israeli companies. And it's also applied for permits through Via Systems Toronto Inc., which it acquired in 2015 to ship bombs, torpedoes, rockets, missiles, and other explosive devices and components to Israel. In Calgary, protesters picketed the local office of United States weapon manufacturer RTX, formerly known as Raytheon, on February 26. RTX develops and sells military equipment to Israel, including miss missiles launched from F-16 and F-35 fighter jets. Protesters tied the main gate shut and attached a banner saying, Canada stop arming Israel to it. That same morning, 40 protesters in Peterborough, Ontario, picketed outside the Safran Technologies facility during the morning shift change, 
and Safran produces telemetry equipment and battlefield targeting technology for the Israeli military. Protesters in Vancouver blockaded the entrance to a Hikvision promotional event for several hours on February 27, and Hikvision sell surveillance cameras to the Israeli military that are used in illegal Israeli settlements in occupied Palestine. Workers in Quebec City protested at the offices of Talis to condemn their complicity in the Israeli genocide and raise awareness in the community. And Talis supplies radars, missiles and components used in the Air Force, Navy and ground forces. And protesters also shut down the offices of the Lockheed Martin Department of National Defense campus near British Columbia's capital of Victoria on February 28 and gathered with banners at the Colt Canada plant in Kitchener, Ontario on February 28, bringing attention to the company's rifles being used by the Israeli military. According to WBW, Israel ordered 18,000 assault rifles from Colt as recently as November. The movement for Palestine in Canada is growing in strength, and the targeted actions against weapons manufacturers have been effective. It's also come out that Israeli real estate companies are holding exhibitions in Canada to promote the sale of land in the occupied West Bank. At least 500,000 Israelis now live in settlements in the occupied West Bank, and several consecutive Israeli governments have expanded settlements there. But these construction of homes for Israeli settlers has stepped up significantly under the right-wing government of ben Benjamin Netanyahu. And despite Canada and the United Nations recognizing that these Israeli settlements are violations of international conventions, the Canadian government has done nothing to stop sales of occupied land. In response, Palestine solidarity activists mobilized in mass demonstrations at sites of the land sales, and two protests were held within days in Toronto and another in Montreal. And the sales have been held at local synagogues with Jewish activists decrying the use of holy spaces for profiting from land theft and dispossession. In response to United States President Joe Biden's continued support for Israel's genocidal war in Gaza, the Listen to Michigan campaign called on Democratic Party voters in the state's primary elections to withhold their support for Biden by choosing the uncommitted option on the ballot. Campaign manager Leila Alabed, who's a sister of the Palestinian American Congress representative Rashida Tlaib, told the Detroit Free Press that having the option to vote uncommitted gives us a strong unifying vehicle to show our discontent and send a message to Biden that we need a permanent ceasefire. Now, organizers had hoped for 10,000 votes during the February 27 primary, but received more than 100,000 politically conscious uncommitted voters, with 99 precincts counted so far. While Biden won the vote in the end, more than 13% of statewide voters lodged a protest vote. In the three cities with the highest percentage of people with Middle Eastern background, which is Dearborn, Hamtrak, and Dearborn Heights, uncommitted votes were higher than Biden's. Democracy Now! host Amy Goodman said that the movement will likely spread to other states, including Minnesota and Washington State, which hold its primary on March 12. Biden's support for Israel's genocide in Gaza is leading many to turn away from establishment politics, and it's showing the power of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign globally and in the US. The uncommitted campaign shows that the fight back and solidarity movement will take many forms. Protest voting is one way, so long as it is combined with public demonstrations. What you've just heard is audio from police attacking an International Women's Day march in Mexico. Well, an estimated 180,000 people marched in Mexico City for IWD, with huge marches in other cities across the country. In Puebla, authorities criminalized the women's march by covering key buildings and fountains in the main plaza in giant metal sheets and wooden boards. Frustrated with impunity prior to and during the march, 
Women, trans and non-binary people denounced their rapists and attackers by writing their names and pasting printed photos on the metal sheets and wooden boards and other surfaces around the city. Numerous cover-ups of serial rapists in various institutions, such as major universities, were denounced, while others chanted the names of missing and murdered loved ones as they marched. One of the main chants was, The police don't protect me, my female friends protect me. Now, the police proved this right by arresting numerous protesters, spraying high-powered hoses and tear gas, and throwing rocks and glass bottles at protesters. Salim Valley, who's a South African human rights activist and professor and director of the Center of, for Education Rights and Transformation at the University of Johannesburg, said South Africans are deeply disturbed by the character assassination and threats leveled against Leila Khaled, an icon of anti-colonial struggle. Khaled is held in high esteem around the world and was embraced by Nelson Mandela when she first visited South Africa in 2006. Salim Valley said Mandela, who was also called a terrorist by many Western leaders, rejoiced in meeting Khaled and spoke for most South Africans when he expressed his admiration for her courage, sacrifices and fortitude. He viewed her as a symbol of the struggle against oppression throughout the world and an inspiration for South Africans fighting apartheid. Vali said it is unconscionable that the federal government of Australia's censorship and gagging of Khaled occurs at a time when even the judges of the International Court of Justice consider Israel to be committing a genocide. He said, refusing Khaled a visa and outrageously attempting to prevent her from even speaking virtually is a futile effort to stop Australians from learning the truth about genocide. Now, Salim Bali and Leila Khaled will both be speaking at the Eco-Socialism 2024 conference in Borlu or Perth on June 28 to 30. And you can find out more and book your tickets at the link in the podcast description or go to ecosocialism.org.au. Now you can read more about all of these stories we've talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, consider becoming a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us continue doing the work we do and reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Check out the Green Left Activist calendar at greenleft.org.au slash events to find out about upcoming events and protests in your city. And thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left online on social media for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.